Hello, we're entering into week two. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview with this video. Um, and then also I'll give a short lecture on chapter two and chapter three. Uh, this week, we're going to be diving into explaining drug use and abuse. Why do people get addicted? How do people get addicted? We're going to begin to explore those issues. We're also going to hit on some of the drug use regulations and laws. These are the things I want you to learn from this week. I want you to be able to leave this week knowing three to five major factors responsible for addiction. What gets or starts or triggers addiction? Um, I want you to know that drug addiction can co-occur with various types of mental disorders and that's called comorbidity. We'll be going into that. I want you to be able to list and briefly describe three models that um, use to describe addiction and know that these three models are not all the models, but these are the three approaches on, uh, that is used uh, that you'll see a lot in the research to, to, to begin to understand how and why addiction happens. Um, there's a process for regulating drugs. We're gonna talk about the Food Drug Administration. We're gonna hit on the DEA just a little bit. And then I really want you to know the, the scheduling levels of drugs and then I want you to be able to provide examples of each level. Your assignments this week. You need to di um, do a discussion post. This is worth five points. Your assignment on addiction models where I have you look at one of the three models that I'm gonna be talking about in lecture. Uh, and I want you to actually define them and then briefly discuss them. And then your chapter reviews, this is important to know, they do not close until December, but they are directly tied to your quizzes and your midterm and your final. I will be entering zeros when they're past due so you can feel how they impact your grade, but I would not wait on that. I would do them every week. It's painless. You can take as many times as you want to get 100%. And then I'm gonna be giving out badges to those people who are on time um, with their assignments and who will go above and beyond in the online class, those badges will be worth points at the end of the semester. So um, try to stay on top of everything uh, as much as you can. So as you're listening to this, I'm hoping that you um, have deadlines written out, you have the syllabus printed out, you've looked at the calendar, and you've kind of uh, allocated a date each week to work on this class. And then of course, I would touch bases and look at the class at least one, two to three times a week to make sure that you're not missing discussion posts or things that are happening in, in the class. Okay, so with that said, um, oh, uh, I also had a question about workbooks. Um, what, if you need to turn in the workbook sheets, the answer is no. Um, those workbook sheets that, I, that you see in the modules over here, so when I click on the modules, these workbook sheets, and see this is my week two right here. So these are all the, everything lined up for week two. Um, so you're gonna see the overview, the video I'm gonna post there. Um, I definitely want you to look at this website. Here are the slides. Here's the comorbid comorbidity and drugs website. And these worksheets right here, I would print out those worksheets and use them to go through the chapter it kind of helps you take notes using those. And then what you do is you put those in a binder. And when we have a quiz, you have those handy and ready. And boom, you've got, you've got all your notes. It's just really great. Um, you're probably thinking, oh, thank you, Professor Barron, for posting those. No, really, seriously, they're awesome. Okay, but that's for you just to have as a resource. And then you'll see all the items do here. Um, week two, scheduled drugs, models of addiction, um, and then look at the deadlines. Uh, you know, this video I'll probably use again. Uh, it's a great little overview. These deadlines, you have to pay attention to them. They, they um, may shift a little bit, but you get the idea, okay? So with that, um, I'm gonna go into chapter two. Now, um, I wanna say that the slides, I, I printed them out um, and put them on a PDF so you could take notes as I'm doing this lecture. So you'll see those in the, um, in the module there. Okay, so I want to get 
to uh, hmm. meeting controls. And make sure I have a screen share on here. Oh, good, it has been. Sorry about that, guys. I had to make sure that we were in screen share. So um, I'm going to start from the beginning here. Um, actually, I'm going to keep it open like this so it doesn't um, throw the whole screen. Uh, so I'm going to move this over a little bit. So uh, beginning, and we're going to really talk about what causes drug addiction today, uh, and really dive into that. Why do people use drugs? What causes people to subject their bodies and minds to this harmful effects? harmful effects of non-medical or recreational drug use. Um, if you talk to someone who's been addicted to drugs or if you've ever experienced addiction yourself, it is not something that is in control. It's compulsive. And if you look at MRI scans, you'll see that the control feature of your brain actually shuts off when someone becomes drug addicted. There is no common sense. It is an obsession. It is compulsion. So what happens to cause people to start to do this? Why is drug use a more serious problem today in the past? And why are some people attracted to recreational drug use um, more than others? And, and if you read the textbook, they actually go into each one of these questions. Um, and believe it or not, there are real triggers and there's some people can be chemically set up to be more prone to drug addiction. And yes, genetics can actually make someone more um, pre, uh, predisposed to um, addiction. So what is addiction? And, and NIH really looks at this, and National Institute on Drug Abuse really looks at this as the idea that it's a reopsing brain disease. They actually look at the disease model, and it's characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. So when someone, um, or one of the big tests to, for someone to say they've been, are, are addicted, they'll say they're completely out of control. It, the, the drug has consumed their life. It's considered a brain disease by the National Institute on Drug Abuse and by um, mental health because it changes the actual chemical structure of the brain and how it works. These brain changes can be long lasting and can lead to harmful behavior seen in people who, who abuse drugs. So, Addiction really actually changes brain chemistry. So this is how they di diagnose it. And, and uh, I want to say that for extra credit, and, um, and I'm only going to say this in the video. I'm not going to post it anywhere else because I want to see who's actually watching these videos. If you go to the library, they have the DSM-5 there, and you can hold it up, take a picture of it, and upload it, and that will be substantial extra credit for you. If you look in the DSM-5, they have all the different diagnoses uh, around addiction. And it can be pharma uh, pharmacological in the sense that someone's addicted to the pharmacy, uh, to drugs themselves. Um, excessive time spent obtaining the substance, so they, they go out of their way and they become obsessed on their next fix. And then craving the drug, just really all the time, all the time thinking about it. So anyone who's ever stopped or quit smoking, um, you, and, and you can talk to people who've done that or you've experienced it yourself. It's just constantly thinking about when am I going to have that next smoke? I need a smoke. Um, and starting to actually feel symptoms of, of addiction. Okay, so that, that's a good analogy. Um, social impairment, risky use of behavior, um, tolerance. This is a big one, tolerance. Someone who's addicted to alcohol, for example, um, it takes more and more alcohol for them to even look drunk, but they're still drunk. So someone who says they have a high tolerance to alcohol, that's a sign that they've been, been drinking a lot. So their body has learned how to compensate for that, and they have to drink more in order to feel the effects of the alcohol. And their actual withdrawal symptoms with some of these drugs, people can become physically addicted, and it can be serious withdrawals. So I want you to look at your book right now. And if you look at your book, they have all these key terms um, in there. Um, it's back in the back of the book. It's in a learning portfolios. I'm grabbing you in the book right now. And um, you'll see all the key terms there. What I would do is uh, you 
have that open as you do the workbooks uh, sheets or as you do the, um, the chapter reviews. Do you know all these key terms? If you know them already, great. If this is the first time seeing some of those key terms, those are things to look out for as you read the chapter. And then this, they have this great little summary at the end, which is awesome. I would read that too. So what's the nature of addiction? Is it a bad habit? Is it a failure of healthy choices? Is it a failure of morality? Is it a symptom of other problems? Is it a chronic disease? Um, it could be um, considered any of these. And some people, there's this moral model where people think that drug addiction is as someone's morally flawed. But the reality is, is that when we look at drug addiction, it is really a disease and it chemically changes the brain. Okay, that's not excusing addiction or addictive behavior, but it's, it's really when someone's being treated for addiction, it's a chemical change in the brain chemistry and someone can be both addicted um, in different ways. And one of the terms I absolutely want you to know is co comorbidity. It's the idea that someone can have two diseases at the same time. They can have mental health disorders, like for example, have be schizophrenic and treating themselves with a drug to maintain um, balance. Now you can uh, talk to people, you have sometimes people who have mental health disorders and they'll say that they use alcohol or they use marijuana or they use different drugs to help them with their anxiety or, or to control and numb themselves. Um, I had one student once tell me that um, she used marijuana so that she wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't say things out in class because she was slightly um, autistic and didn't want to um, say things that were um, not right. So this, this, this is something to think about is that, you know, people can self-treat to do this. And I will say that unfortunately when people self-treat, um, they're not under medical care and it can actually make things worse. So comorbidity, comorbidity, comorbidity is substance abuse, use, and other mental disorders at the same time. So when someone has two or more disorders at the same time, and this uh, often occurs with substance abuse. So this could be one of the factors that leads to substance abuse is that someone self-treating anxiety, depression, angst, uh, a mental health issue, anything, okay? Who's affected? 7.7 .7 million people. And 37.9 um, ha also had mental illnesses. And about among the 42.0 million adults with mental health and illnesses, 18.2 also had substance use disorders. So it becomes a chicken egg kind of thing. Is it the substance abuse that triggered the mental health, or is it the mental health that triggered the substance abuse? I would say both. It's really dependent on the person. Who gets treated? Um, a lot of people do not get treated. Uh, just look at all those people who do not get treated. 52.5%. So you can see that addiction and mental health dis, uh, disorders often are not treated um, and they can occur at the same time. 10 reasons why the drug use is more serious today. This was one of the objectives. Um, drugs have become a more widespread phenomenon, they're easier to access. Um, they're more potent. You're gonna see that when we talk about marijuana, the THC levels of marijuana and the 1960s are way, way, way different than the levels now. Much stronger now, the levels. It's a big, big business. A lot of money. People experiment with both illegal, illicit, that's what illicit means, and licit, which means legal, okay? And they're more exposed. People have more exposed to drug advertising, just even driving to BC um, every morning I go, I come here and I see all the marijuana shops. There's greater access, more advertising, and there's a low cost. There are drugs out there that are very obtainable at very low cost. Stronger drugs, more dangerous drug use and especially drug dealing. And this is interesting, seven in 10 drug users work full time. So there are a lot of people who are working and using drugs at the same time. 
is really prevalent and it's and and you know one of the things about addiction is it's a secret a lot of times it's a secret people are hiding and one of the things that um, Alcoholic Anonymous would say or is when people attend these meetings is surrendering to that secret and letting it go okay so basic reasons these are all the reasons why people can can take drugs when you think about it people say oh I need to have that glass of wine to unwind um, it could be many many different reasons from a, a, a improving athletic performance relieving pain um, you could probably think of some more reasons so I want you to look this up in your book right now. I want you to know the three addiction models I'm going to hit on now, but I want you to see the theoretical explanations around biological, the physiological, like the psychology, and the sociological, like the social pressures that people go to, and then the danger signs of abuse. I want you to know those. Those are things that you need to recognize if you're in the healthcare field, education, a parent, whatever, um, a spouse, a sibling, these are things that you need to know and and for ourselves too we always have to kind of do a mental check is this becoming an addictive behavior so things to think about and then for the key terms that's something to know for the test do you think genes matter is there a relationship between mental health disorders and drugs and what are the risk factors this is in your book make sure you read that about how people can be gen genetically predisposed I want you to know the difference between physical dependence and psychological dependence. I had a student really describe this very well. She said physical dependence is when um, you could die if you do not have someone medically treat you to get off the drug or you have physical symptoms of withdrawal. Psychological dependence is you feel like dying if you don't have the drug. Do you see the difference? So and in some ways, being physically dependent might be easier because if you're, you could get off of it physically, but psychologically, how does someone fix this, what's cognitively in your head, being psychologically addicted? And I have to say, one of those drugs, meth, it has very low physical dependence, but it has a very high psychological dependence. So each drug that we talk about, you're going to need to know if someone's can be more prone to be physically dependent or more prone to be psychologically dependent or both. Now, these are the three models that I want you to be aware of, and this will be in your uh, assignment post. The moral model is about poor morals and lifestyle that drug addiction is a choice. And so some people kind of approach drug addiction that way. The disease model is what the uh, medical field and how public health model, uh, the public health field approaches it, which is that addiction is both chronic and progressive, and that people can be physically addicted. And then some people approach it as a personality pre predis a predisposition model. And this is the idea that if someone can have these seeking, thrill seeking uh, tendencies and um, actually seek out drug use, okay? So anyway, Look at those different models and you need to read about them. They're in your book, okay? And the biological model, um, I have the NIH reward centers. I absolutely want you to watch this. This really talks about how drugs actually come in and start to mimic and substitute for neurotransmitters in your brain. And that's how people become biologically addicted to a drug, okay? Very fascinating stuff. And we are going to go over each one of these areas for each type of drug is when we dive in to each drug, you will see how someone, how it biologically works in the brain. So definitely watch that NIH video. Um, there are three principles. It's abused. Um, there are psychiatric disorders and there are genetic explanations under the biological theories. There are social theories too that people can actually learn from seeing. So. Um, like someone who has a parent who's smoking and then a child mimics the parent, okay? So there's social influences. Um, under the social influences, there are things called labeling theories where people start to label people into groups, okay? Or the subculture theory is where there's a, uh, within a group, 
there's a subculture that kind of lives and supports each other for the drug use. So for example, um, having a whole group of friends that drink and always meet on Thursdays and Fridays for happy hour, um, that's like a subculture and it can grow into being that that's the culture that becomes the norm and could support an addictive habit. Not saying that that is addiction, but it could support that. So here are the dangerous signs of abuse. Um, do people af often ask about drug use? Have they noticed change? Are people defensive? Um, are they embarrassed or frightened by, by the behavior? Um, have you ever seen a doctor, a new doctor, because your regular doctor would not prescribe the drug you wanted? When you're uh, are under pressure or feel anxious, do you automatically take a depressant stimulant or drink? Do you take drugs more often or for purposes other than what's recommended by your drug, doctor? And that's, that's drug abuse and drug misuse, very similar. Drug abuse is abusing the drug. Drug misuse can lead to drug abuse. And these are all the different types of questions that I want people to read, okay? So I want you to be able to do these chapter reviews and then there's extra credit I'm going to post based on this video lecture. Now I'm going to move on to the next one, which is chapter three. This one's going to go really quickly because the big thing I want you to know out of this one is, are some just big things about, ooh, um, about the um, laws around it. Um, they're, they're really, you'll see that practically every drug that we are going to be studying, a legal drug, was legal at one point. So the question is who made it illegal and who regulates the drugs and the answer to that is the food drug administration and the drug enforcement agency so drugs all have to have patents okay so this started to happen in the late 1800s and but then we started to see some problems in the 1900s so what happened was is in 1906 the pure food and drug act came in to effect and started to say you need to tell people what's in these drugs so imagine that, like Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it, okay? So now, obviously Coca-Cola does not have cocaine in it. It has caffeine in it, but you get the idea. Then in 1912, they amended the law to state what effects it has, whether they're therapeutic or that they really work. Then they started to do this thing where they started finding that people would actually die and get and and really get serious birth defects. You can read in your book about this birth defect um, from, um, from prenatal exposure um, and that had horrible effects, um, one of the drugs in there. So read about that. So they had to come in and they started to control it, okay? And they started to say, we need to identify and, qual and, and make sure we know what is in our food. That's the Food Drug Administration. So they started to have another amendment where they said, okay, this now you need to tell people whether this is habit forming, okay? And you start to tell people more. And then they kept moving along with amendments and then FDA was finally empowered to withdraw approval of a drug that was already been marketed. And FDA was finally given approval to start regulating all, all um, non-prescription drugs and and well, not non-prescription drugs, but prescription drugs. Although within reason with non-prescription, that's a whole nother story. So regulating a new drug. So every drug needs to be approved, okay? And it needs to be approved by the FDA. So they have to go through this testing period. First, they have to test it with animal testing. Then they have to do clinical trials, and one of them being human testing, and then finally it starts to go through marketing it and then they watch it. This is a food drug administration. Okay, they're in charge of watching drugs get regulated. So I talked through these steps, steps one, step two, step three, okay? Oh, and by the way, these are on your slides that you can print out. So you can put those in your binder. There's a new drug application that they always have to go through and they have to make a formal request to go through these, these stages to be approved. But then they also have fast tracking rules. Let's say there's certain drugs that are for rare cancers or AIDS, they'll start to fast track it just to get it out there so that people could start to use it. And they have designations. Now, people will argue that sometimes the FDA 
has a conflict. Um, and sometimes the FDA is pressured to market a drug faster than it should. And you'll see sometimes that the FDA will scramble and pull a drug off the market when they start to see something um, bad happen, like people dying or getting heart attacks or reacting to a drug. <coughs> so, but they, they, <coughs> But it always needs clinical evidence for it to be, be, um, to be put out there. But there are exceptions to special drug marketing laws. Um, there are attack advantages for people who develop drugs for rare diseases to really kind of encourage F, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies to do things um, that are not so profitable. And then um, they start to increase the reviewers and to Increase review time to get them through these laws. So um, the regulation of non-prescription drugs that started in 1972, they started to look at non-prescription drugs. And so FDA has an over-the-counter OTC, means over-the-counter medications. These are any drugs that you can get without um, a, 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 a prescription from the doctor. So for example, um, aspirin, ibuprofen, they have to be able to meet these criteria. It's safe and effective. They're safe and effective, and, they're, and they, have, they don't have unacceptable indications like, oh, I don't know, dot, death, stroke, heart, you know, uh, you could you know, really be serious, and insufficient data to permit final classification. So in other words, they have to be, be shown that they, they, they fit into some of these char characteristics. And they fit into one of these character categories. Now, obviously, number three, they're not going to be over the counter if they fall into out of this category. And number two, um, obviously not. So it has to fit for number one. They have something called switching, where a drug must have been used by prescription for at least three years. So remember when, um, what's the one? Claritin. Claritin used to be over the counter, uh, uh, prescription only, and now it's considered. Um, over the counter. So for three years, it has to be out there and it has to be something that's used often and it doesn't have serious adverse drug reactions. Um, they, there's a lot of advertising and which in other countries you will not see other at this, as much advertising. So, hmm, that's something maybe we need to think about is that do we really need to advertise drugs? Um, and then, you know, there's a direct consumer advertising and that it's out there. And this is a big thing too. What about marketing to physicians? Hmm. We'll be talking about that with the opiate crisis. Um, one of the big culprits with our opiate crisis is physicians have overprescribed. And sometimes they are being pressured to prescribe. So this is something to think about this. Approximately 75% of physicians surveyed indicated that ads cause patients to think that the drugs work. And then they come in and they pressure the doctor to prescribe them a drug. Okay, so think about that. So one of the big things is that they started to control the production of addiction substances in 1914. Okay, so after they got past through all this, but they started to see people were getting addicted to certain types of drugs. So one of the things that they did was they started to schedule these drugs. And this is really important. I want you to know the different schedules. Schedule one, two, three, four, and five. And one could say that this would, could argue that some drugs could be moved around or should be moved into another category. This will be your discussion question for this week. So scheduling, I want you to look in your book. They have a great little chart on scheduling. And I want you to see that substance abuse have high abuse potential and no currently approved medical uses. So substances of Schedule two have high abuse potential but are approved for medical uses and can be prescribed. And Schedule two through five reflect the likelihood of abuse, but there is clinical usefulness. And you will see, you will see that many of these drugs, some drugs you will be shocked are, are in there. And one of the things is that you need to know is that the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, really watches the scheduling of drugs and how drugs are scheduling is, is linked to how much time someone gets um, the regulations around it and the law. So based on where a drug falls, it, it really ties also to the law. 
So these are some of the factors that determine it. And I'm not gonna read those, but you need to know that they, they get pushed into those based on those. There's something called drug courts, where it works with people to um, help them um, if they've been treated and uh, get actual addiction um, support. Because one of the big things is when someone's addicted, they will do anything to get the drug, and that includes breaking the law. So I also want you to know that there are different types of drug testing. Um, and drug testing is um, breathalyzer, urine, blood, and hair specimens, okay? And I recently heard that they actually came out with a test for um, breathalyzer for marijuana. So we'll see about that. Because remember, marijuana is illegal at the federal level. Although it's legal in the state of California, it's illegal federally. Okay. So now I want to go back out to, um, to our website. And I want you to see this. I want you to see one. These are the NIH reward videos. I want you to watch this. And then um, as far as the scheduling, I put, um, ooh, there's a link for the scheduling. I'll make sure that that gets in here. There's week two, week three. So there's definitely some scheduling um, information. Here's a review of core morbidity, and I'll put the scheduling link in there if it's not there already. Um, you definitely need that. All right, good. So any questions, remember you can Canvas message me over here in my inbox, and I look forward to your discussion post and to your assignments. And I will be getting that the scheduling link in there. So be looking for that schedule link.